test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You are going to hear a conversation between Angela and Mr. Ray. Angela is applying to join the library. Listen to the conversation and complete the form below. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will never hear the recording a second time. Hello. How can I join the library? Well, you need to make an application. Would you like to do it now? Yes, if I can. One moment, and I'll get the form. Now, I just need to ask you a few questions before you sign at the bottom. Okay. Your full name, please. Angela Mary Price. Price. Yes, that's right. Okay, and your address? Apartment three, eighty-six Bridge Street, Pimlico. Bridge Street. That's just near here, isn't it? Yes, not very far. Good. So the postcode must be two o six five, right? Yes, that's right. Now your telephone number. I need both home and work if you have them. My home number is eight seven six three five one four two, and work. Is eight four five six one three zero seven. Do you need anything else, like ID or something? Yes, your driver's license will do if you have one. Right, it's easy to remember. I know it by heart. Four zero four zero A C. I'm afraid I'll also need to see it. Okay, here it is. Thanks. And your date of birth, please. Twenty four March nineteen eighty one. Okay, thanks. That's the most important part completed. But if you don't mind, I'd also like to ask you a few questions for a survey we're conducting. Yes, that's okay. Now you have some time to read questions six to ten. As the conversation continues, answer questions six to ten. What kind of books do you like to read? Here's a list to look at. Oh, it varies from time to time, but I always like to relax and learn about other countries I might visit one day. I don't like anything too heavy or serious, unless it's about animals or the environment. I'm not really into sport very much. Anything else? Well, I do like entertaining at home. You know, dinner parties. So I suppose you'll have something for me in that line. The pictures in those books always make me hungry, although they never seem to turn out exactly as they look in the books. Fine. I think that's all I need now. Except I need you to sign here on the application form. Oh, and I almost forgot. The membership fee is twenty dollars, which is refundable if you no longer stay a member. There you are. Do I sign at the bottom here? Yes, that's right. You can borrow books now if you wish, although your membership card won't be ready until next week. So if you want to borrow today, you can pick up your card when you return your first books. That's if you want to take some now. I think I will, but I'll have a look around first. Okay, take your time. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to listen to a radio program on sleep deprivation. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. With us in the studio today are Dr. Peter Collins, a senior lecturer in the Department of Psychology at the University of Chicago, and Helen Gardner, the author of the book Deep Sleep. They've come to our studio to discuss the effects of sleep deprivation. And also give some tips to the sleep deprived on how to deal with the problem. Welcome to the studio, Helen and Peter. Now, Peter, what are the reasons for sleep deprivation, and how can it affect our lives? Well, the research into sleep deprivation started in the late fifties and has been going on ever since. Many researchers link sleep deprivation with electricity, television, and computers. Which have enabled humans to work twenty-four-seven. Before electricity was invented, people's body clocks were synchronized with the sun's schedule, and the average time they spent sleeping was eight to nine hours a night. By nineteen seventy-five, that average was down to seven hours, and today one third of us sleep less than six hours a day. This leads to a condition called chronic sleep deprivation. Which basically means going for extended periods of time with less sleep than your body needs. Chronic sleep deprivation can cause a variety of physical and psychological problems. At its most basic level, loss of sleep can make us more irritable and less efficient, and can affect long-term memory and concentration, which can result in more accidents. According to the latest research into sleep deprivation, sleep deprivation is the main reason for three percent of plane crashes, ten percent of domestic accidents, twenty percent of accidents at work, and forty-five percent of all traffic accidents. Research into the physical effects of chronic sleep deprivation suggests more serious and significant long-term complications. Research from my university, the University of Chicago, has shown that sleep deprivation interferes with how the human body regulates insulin and sugar metabolism, which can increase the risk of diabetes. People who are sleep deprived have weakened immune systems and are more prone to viruses and other kinds of infections. People who don't get enough sleep have cognitive problems or difficulties processing and assimilating new information. Lack of sleep affects long-term memory, and slows down such abilities as judgment and reaction times. Some researchers link sleep deprivation with obesity. Indicating that sleep disorders and eating disorders are often linked. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Helen, 
You've done a fair amount of research for your recent book on helping people deal with sleeping problems. Could you give our listeners some tips on managing their sleep? Well, if you spend several hours a night tossing and turning in bed, trying to fall asleep, you first have to find out how much sleep you need. To do so, you'll need to try and sleep six to nine hours a night. Set aside three days for the experiment. It's best to do it on a long weekend or a holiday to ensure it doesn't get interrupted. During the experiment, you should go to bed at the same time every night and give yourself six, seven, eight or nine hours of sleep. Then monitor the way you feel throughout the day to find out how many hours of sleep you need in order to feel your best. Once you find out how much sleep you need, you can work on improving the quality of your sleep. The main secret here is to allow yourself one or two hours to relax before going to bed. You may want to try and have a warm shower or bath before going to bed. Doing some quiet activities such as reading or filing can help some people relax. A warm drink in bed helps to induce sleepiness. Some people take up yoga or meditation to help them relax at night. Different techniques will work for different people, so it's best to experiment and find the one that suits you best. You should definitely avoid using technology before going to bed. Activities such as playing video games, watching TV and others which require you to use your attention can stop you from falling asleep. Avoid eating before going to bed. A late dinner can disrupt your sleep. Not only is going to bed with a heavy stomach bad for digestion and can make you overweight, but it can also keep you awake for hours. Caffeine-rich drinks can increase your heart rate, which can stop you from falling asleep. Energy drinks also have the same effect on your body. You should avoid drinking these at night. The same goes for vigorous physical exercise, such as weightlifting or working out on a treadmill. In many cases, you can reset your body clock and make it tick for you by changing your lifestyle. If your sleep deprivation is severe, it's always best to seek professional advice and get an appointment with your doctor, who might prescribe you sleeping pills. Thank you, Helen. We'll be back after the break and we'll be answering questions we've received from our listeners. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two geography students, Jack and Katie, talking about a field trip to Kenya in Africa. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Katie, hi. Thanks for inviting me round. Oh, thanks for coming. I know you're up to your neck in finals revision, but I've got to make up my mind about next year's geography field trip. 
and I'd really like your advice. We've got to choose between an African trip and one in Europe. They've told us a bit about both trips in the lecture, but I really can't make up my mind. And I know you did the African one last year. That's right. So where exactly did you go? I mean, I know it was in Kenya, in East Africa. Yes. Well, we were right up in the northwest of the country. It was beautiful. We stayed in a place called the Marich Pass Field Studies Center. Right. Dr. Rowe said the accommodation was traditional African-style cottages.、Uh, he had a special name for them. Bandas. Yes, they're fine. You have to share two or three people together. They're pretty basic, but you have a mosquito net. They don't provide spray though, so remember to take plenty with you. You'll need it. <laughs> And there's no electricity in the field center. You'll have hurricane lamps instead. They give a good light. It's no problem. What about places to study? Dr. Rowe said there was a library. Yes, but it's quite small. There's a lecture room as well, but most of us worked out in the open air. There are plenty of places outside. And it's so beautiful. You're right in the middle of the forest clearing. I gather it's a relatively unmodernized area. Definitely, they actually set up the centre there because it's on the boundaries of two distinct ecological zones: the mountains, where the people are mainly agriculturalists, and the semi-arid plains lower down, where they're semi-nomadic pastoralists. Before you hear the rest of the conversation. You have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen, and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. So, how much chance did you get to meet the local people there? Did you get the chance to do interviews? Yes, though we had to use local interpreters, but that was okay. Then we did field observation, of course, looking at environmental and cultural conditions and morphological mapping. What's that? Oh, looking at the surface forms of the landscape, the slope elements, and so on. What about specific projects? Yes, after the first two or three days, we spent most of our time on those. We could pretty well do what we wanted, although they all had to relate to issues concerned with development in some way. People did various things. Some were based on social and cultural topics, like the effect of education on the aspirations of young people, and some did more physical process-based studies, looking at things like soil erosion. My group actually looked at issues relating to water, things like sources such as rivers and wells, and quality, and so on. It was a good project to work on, but a bit frustrating. We felt we needed a lot more time, really. Right, Dr. Rowe did say something about limiting project scope. Yes, he told us that too at the beginning, and I can see why now. What else? Well, we had some good trips out as part of the course. We went to a market town, a place called Sigur, that was to study distribution, and to look at agricultural production. We went to the Weiwei Valley. That's an important agricultural region. And what about animals? Did you have a chance to go to a national park? Sure, we did a trip on the last day, on the way back to the airport at Nairobi. But actually, there was lots of wildlife at the field centre. Vervet monkeys and baboons and lizards.、Mm, it does sound good. It was excellent, I'd say. In terms of logistics, it was very well run, but it was more than that. I mean, it's not the sort of place I'd ever have got to on my own, and it was a real eye opener. It got me really interested in development issues and the way other people live. I did find it frustrating at the time that we couldn't get as far as we wanted on the project. But actually, I'm going to follow it up in my dissertation, so it's given me some ideas and data for that as well. So you'd say it was worth the extra money? Definitely. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute 
to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer talking about food preservation. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-seven. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-seven. In today's lecture, I'd like to look at the topic of food preservation, and start by asking the obvious question: Why do we need to preserve food? Well, apart from keeping it fresh for our daily needs, many foods, such as fruit and vegetables, are only available at certain times of the year. So. If we want to be able to eat these foods all year round, we need to preserve them. We also need to preserve food for export overseas to make sure that it doesn't perish in transit. And lastly, we need to be able to preserve food for when there are food shortages. There are a number of methods of preserving food which involve both high and low temperatures, chemicals, irradiation, and drying. Let's have a look at these in turn. In the 1870s, the French scientist Louis Pasteur showed that microorganisms in food could be destroyed by raising the temperature of the food, a process now known as pasteurization. This involves heating milk to just 65 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. A new method, the ultra-high temperature or UHT process. Involves heating milk to 150 degrees Celsius for three seconds. The advantage of treating milk in this way is that it lasts much longer. Though I tend to feel, and I'm sure many of you would agree, that taste is somewhat sacrificed in the UHT process. <laughs> <laughs> Tin cans were first used in the early 1800s to store and preserve food. Just as they are now, the cans were tin-plated steel containers. And the process had the advantage of being cost-effective. Unfortunately, however, there were many early cases of food poisoning because the canning process was not fully understood at that stage. We now know the exact temperature and length of time each food needs for proper preservation, which has greatly reduced the risk of food poisoning. People living in cold climates often preserve food by burying it in the snow, and the Romans knew all about the advantages of packing food in ice. But for most people, this was not an option until the invention of the refrigerator in 1834. Today, however, refrigeration is the most important means of preserving food, because the food stays fresh without needing to be treated. However, refrigeration requires an electricity supply, and unfortunately, if the power goes off, so does the food. <laughs> A variety of chemicals can be added to food, and you'll find their names listed on the labels of cans and bottles. Salt is probably the oldest of all the chemical preservatives, and was used by many ancient civilizations for many years. Sugar also acts as a preservative, and is used to preserve jams in much the same way that vinegar is used to pickle foods. Chemical preservatives are effective. But they do not suit all foods, and the processes involved are time-consuming. Another method of preserving food is by drying it. Most foods are 75% to 90% water, so if you remove the water, the microorganisms simply can't survive. 
When food is dried, it not only lasts a long time, but it also becomes much lighter, which is a big advantage, as this makes it cheap to store. Though some people argue that valuable nutrients are lost in the process. In the second part, the speaker describes the process of drying food. Look at questions 38 to 40. Now listen carefully and label the diagram. Early methods for drying food involved cutting it into strips and hanging it in the sun or over fires. But there are now a number of more modern methods which involve the use of recent technology. One of these is known as roller drying and it's a highly effective way of making dried foods from liquids such as soup. Have a look at this diagram to see how it works. Well, first of all, the hot soup is poured in at one end here. The liquid spreads to form a thin layer on a heated belt. The liquid dries as it moves along. By the time it reaches the end of the belt, all the water has evaporated, leaving only dry powder. A blade then scrapes the dried material off the roller and captures it in powder form. All you have to do is add boiling water and you have your hot soup back again, ready to drink. Another method is called freeze drying. And for those of you who still remain. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Speed to the city streets, we begin to feel the fire. We rise like tall buildings as the chemicals they take us higher. The night's young and it's just begun as she puts her hand in mine. Chase the night, wanna dance to the light. Pours dust from the sky, just two hearts running wild. Never sleep, never stop. Every shot from the top, we're gonna, we're gonna be two hearts running wild.